So, I'm very glad that you have decided to join us. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yes! And I would like you to start with what was it like growing up in Philadelphia and what was going on in your life the moment that you realized who you are versus who you appeared to be? Yeah. So I can go pretty far back to that moment. Uh, I couldn't put a name on it, however. Uh, but I, I remember the kids in the neighborhood calling me names like faggot and sissy. And I was like four years old. And I knew that whatever the names meant couldn't be a, a good thing. Uh, based on the energy behind the name calling. And so I could see my little four-year-old self looking up at Mr. Pembleton. He was um, our popular neighbor. He was a fireman and all the kids loved to hang out by his garage. And I said, Mr. Pembleton, what does faggot mean? And he looks down at me with this like, you know, look on his face like it was like a frown like why are you asking me that question and of course he never answered my question but he basically told me you don't pay attention because i said to him i said well all the kids are calling me that name and he says you don't pay attention to what those kids are saying and i knew based on that response from him that faggot couldn't be a good thing and that was the first time i felt other I felt like not a part of, kind of ostracized. And I mean, I was an innocent little kid just being my, myself, you know, my authentic self. But yeah, four years old. And then, of course, when school came along, uh, it just, the bullying got relentless. It was just two things that I stood out for. One was me being multiracial, so I looked very different than a lot of the other kids that I went to school with, and then me being effeminate, an effeminate little boy. And so um, they picked on me for both. And especially, you know, when you are a boy, <laughs> there are certain expectations that come with that. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like two little girls can walk down the street and no one will really bat an eye. But if you see two, two little boys holding hands, you know, walking down the street, it's like, you know. And so I think from actually before we're born, once now you can find out what the gender is of right. a kid. So once people know what the gender is, the expectations are already going on that baby, what that baby is supposed to act like and be and grow up to be and all of that. And how did your family deal with all of this? And did you ever share with your family that you were being bullied? I'll tell you. In that sense, I was pretty alone because I even knew then that if I went home and told my dad or my mom that I was being bullied, the question would be, the next question would be like, you know, why? And, you know, I knew that I couldn't go home and say, oh, you know, they're calling me a faggot or they're calling me sissy. Um, it was just already that thing inside of me that I knew that family wouldn't accept it necessarily friends, society. I got that early on. So you really did feel alone for a very long time. I did. You know, I think I always knew I was loved. Like, you know, my, my parents were in my corner, like I was supported and loved. But I think that I felt alone when it came to like my identity and I felt like that had to be a secret. Although I believe that my father and mom, they saw it in me before I even saw it. Cause I just think about the relationship that I had with my dad and how like from very young, I felt like this um, resentment towards me. I couldn't understand why. And it was like this, um, this 
not being able to live up to his expe- expectations of what he wanted in a son. And, you know, um, I remember being at the table. I was scared of my dad. I think a lot of us were growing up. And um, my dad, you know, he also, he, he was an alcoholic. He drank a lot. And so, you know, with alcoholism, you know, there's a whole set of things that come with that when you're in a family uh, that, you know, of someone that is an alcoholic. Um, but with me, it was like scrutiny all the time. I remember sitting at the table and I was eating dinner and my dad was there and he was smoking a cigarette and looking at TV and he had his drink. And I went to pick up my glass and when I picked it up, I picked it up with my pinky out and my dad lost it. He called my mom. He's like, look at him. Look at him. Why is he doing And I'm like, what did I do? I, 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 I didn't even understand it. I was like, what? And, and so it was like walking on eggshells a lot of the time even though I know he loved me. But it was just that thing of like, oh my God, like, I co- there was a time I felt like I couldn't walk right, I couldn't eat right, I couldn't talk right, I couldn't do anything right for my dad. And so, you know, that really plays on your self-esteem. Um, how, how have you overcome something like that? Because that's something that is ingrained in you at such an early age and and pleasing parents yeah. is such an important thing for children to do. Uh, how do you come to terms with it? How did you come to terms with that? And yeah. did your father ever come to terms with you? Yeah, you know, um, it's been a journey. It's been a journey because you're right. When we're kids, all we want to do is please our parents. You know, you want to get the approval from your parents. And so when you're not getting that, it it really affects you. And I believe that a lot of LGBTQ people deal with shame on some level. Shame. Being ashamed of yourself. And um, I think that comes from the way your family may treat you growing up because you're different. And so I'm no exception to that. I had a lot of shame. And um, I always wanted my dad's love, like approval and love. And I I even, I remember when my dad died, um, thinking like a ton of bricks, it hit me. I was like, who do I prove myself to now? <laughs> Who do I prove myself to? <laughs> because all my life, I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was trying to show him that despite the fact that I'm this way, I can make it. And I, not only can I make it, I can be successful in this world. So in an odd kind of way, you know, like... um a rose needs the thorns to protect it. My dad was, he was like my thorns. You know, he gave me a lot of the strength that I think I've needed my whole life to survive what I've gone through as a, a multiracial transgender woman of color. I really do believe that. And um, it took him some time. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like, I'm such a crybaby. I'm sorry. I just feel it to my soul and I get emotional, you know. Um, My makeup's probably a mess already. (laughs) You're fine. I'm fine. You're absolutely fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, So, I, um, there was, okay, so I remember my eighth grade graduation And uh, this is just to show you how much it affected me, the way my dad was with me. Um, I won eight awards. Wow. And I won the most awards out of the whole student body. And the last award that I was given was the highest award that a student could get. 
And they called my name. I went up. I got the award. And I got a standing ovation. And I started to cry. So after the, you know, the ceremony, I run over to my parents. And my dad turned and walked away and walked out. And I looked at my mom and I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, you know, don't worry about it. And we were supposed to go to get Chinese food. We were supposed to go out for Chinese. And we get to the car and my dad's like, we're not going to Chinese. We're going home. And I'm like, what did I do? I just won eight awards, like in my mind. I'm not saying it, but I'm thinking it. Like, I don't understand. And... My mom always trying to make it better. She whispered to me, don't worry, I'll go get the Chinese food and I'll bring it home and, you know, you'll have your Chinese food. But that wasn't the point. I wanted to go out as a family. You know, it was my eighth grade graduation. And um, in retrospect, I believe that my dad felt like his son shouldn't have cried in front of all those people. Because boys don't cry. Because boys don't cry. And um, I think it was embarrassing for him. I don't know what he was going through. Maybe he had a few drinks. I mean, you know, it could have been other stuff that played into it. But I feel like that was the thing. So that just snubbed all the awards I got, the accomplishment, you know, the fact that I was emotional and touched by everyone standing up for me. And I cried. You know, but it was just, uh, it was authentic and it was what I was feeling in the moment. So this is the type of stuff that happened while I was growing up. And let me tell you, my dad, he, one thing I have to give him credit for, he took care of his family. He went to work every day. He provided for us. We always had food on the table, you know, that whole thing. So I wasn't, I, I wouldn't say I was neglected it in that sense like I was taken care of but it was that connection you know that father child (laughs) sometimes when I say son it feels so weird because you know me as a trans woman now but yeah that father son um connection and so I know that I mean as I sit here today and think about my dad I have compassion for him. I have compassion in my heart for him because I know it must have been hard him being, you know, a macho guy and expecting, oh, you know, you have a son and things that he probably wanted to do with me that I just wasn't into, like playing sports. (laughs) Cricket was my dad's game. He was a cricketer, you know, and, um, uh, that's so popular. That game is so popular, like in the um, West Indies, Caribbean and England and India, you know, and so around the world um, in certain places. And he loved his cricket. But I was always afraid of that damn ball. That cricket <laughs> ball is like a rock. And I'm like, ah! like, I'm not playing cricket, honey. I'm sorry. So. Um, so yeah, so I think that, you know, he had hopes and dreams and you know, what a guy would expect having a son. Now, the, the, the thing is, though, he was so proud of me. Like, to his friends, he would, I would hear him. Like, like I'd be in the other room and like maybe he'd be with his buddies drinking or whatever and he'd be bragging about me like, oh, you know, you know, Um, My son did this in school and this and that. He'd brag, but then with me, I didn't get that. You know, I didn't get like, oh, you're proud of me, Dad. So it was, it was, it was a But But isn't that something, and that's partly what fathers do, though. They want you to be tough. I think so. And they don't want to give you the adulation, except for maybe if it's in sports. But yeah. For for a man thing they do, but for doing well in school oh, or right. all those other things. I'm not going to show you. Yes. Yes, you know that's a great point. Yeah. I, you know when you think about that like the stereotype of like the man and like having a son and yeah, if I was playing cricket like the game he loved, he'd probably be, "Oh, I'm so proud of you. You did great." And, but you know, for school, it was a whole other thing or uh, and other activities because I was, 
I was like one of those students that like in high school, especially that was in all sorts of things. I was in student government. I was in debate team, on the debate team. I was on the choir. I volunteered at the American Red Cross, the United Way. I was at the local ho- community hospital, Chestnut Hill Hospital, working um, a couple summers. I mean, I, I was active and I did so much and I excelled, but not the way I think he wanted me to. I even danced on Dance Party USA. <laughs> I was one of the regular dancers, you know, but it's, you know, people have their vision for what you should be doing. And if you're not doing that, yeah, maybe they're not able to embrace what you can do and what you can exceed in and, and that sort of thing. With you being that involved in your community and in your school growing up, Did the bullying ever change once you got to high school? Yes, the bullying changed. I went from the scorned faggot to the popular faggot. So the stigma was still there, but now I was popular. The teachers loved me. I was on, you know, everyone knew who I was. I was, you know, so popular in school. I would walk through the hallway and I'd say, out of 10 people that kids that 10 kids could pass me and probably eight would speak to me. So that was, it was, so I was popular, but still it was the whispers. Oh, you know, they're gay. That kind of thing. Were you out then or were you still closeted? Well, this is the thing. I actually think I could have never really been closeted. I, I, I think I was lying to myself thinking I wasn't, I wasn't. I mean, I just have always been very open and like authentic with like my personality. And so everyone, I think, pretty much knew. But you weren't. I didn't announce it to the world. I didn't announce it to the world. I didn't like announce it to my family or friends of the world. So it was very, still very like under like whispers and you know I had like a really close friend in high school he was gay too so the two of us we were like a team and we'd be talking about the guys that we like and all of that in school but not to say be able to say oh you know yes I'm gay you know and walk with my head up high no no it wasn't because I look at the gener- the kids today and I think to myself in my day LGBTQ support group in school there was none of that. I mean, I think it's a wonderful thing that there is now, but there was none of that. And so, you know, I even think sometimes, like, I remember in junior high school, um, this in sixth grade, I went to my neighborhood junior high school, and they were just horrific with me. And I remember this one guy that was just like a drill sergeant every day. He'd see me in the hallway and he'd be like, you faggot, you fucking faggot, you sissy, all in my face. And um, I remember one day, I couldn't take it anymore. And I literally grabbed this guy's neck and I started choking him and I wouldn't let go. And I remember the teacher couldn't get me off of him. They had to call the vice principal (laughs) and he pulled us off and we were suspended. And I was wishing I, I I just, I didn't ever want to go back to that school. I was happy. So of course my mom went up to the school with me and who do you think they end up suspending for like two more weeks and letting me, letting, letting come back to school. The boy got suspended for two weeks because they knew that, you know, he was a bully and he was going around starting trouble. And me, who never gotten into, in, into any trouble, they let come back and I was thinking, oh, damn, why couldn't I have had two weeks off from this hell? But it also got me in a special program. And so it kind of, pulled me away from like the main population of kids and that kind of gave me a little reprieve with the bullying and then I was able to get accepted to a special magnet school which take took me out of the neighborhood it was more diverse um kids from all over the the city of Philadelphia and so that's when the shift happened where I went from scorned faggot to popular faggot 
Yeah. So, and that's how I explain it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, another thing is in your day, <laughs> um, there were very limited words for trans. Right. I mean, it just wasn't a common occurrence to average people growing up in regular neighborhoods. So where and when did you even learn the language right. and then appropriate the language? Yeah, I always say that, um, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age and you never ask a lady how old she is. But in my day, there wasn't any Internet. So you couldn't go online and say, what does it mean when you're a boy and you feel like a girl? That just wasn't possible. And there wasn't a name for it. Um, so I just always thought I was gay. Like an effeminate gay guy, that's what I thought I was for the longest. And not until I started going to the gay clubs is when I started to connect the dots. I was like, I was seeing trans women and I was like, oh, and it took a while for it to like hit me because actually I used to be afraid of them. I was, and I know why I was afraid. <laughs> I was afraid of the reality of, of me, you know? But after a while, I started to really connect the dots. And I remember, like, when I was little, um, I, the basketball that my dad got me, I would go in my room and close the door and put it under my T-shirt. And I'd walk around like I was pregnant and have the baby. And I'd be like a good mommy. And this is all in my head. And G.I. Joe... He was never going to war. He was always coming home from war. And I was his wife and I was making, you know, dinner for him. And, <laughs> and then when I got old enough, like a teenager to start fantasizing, you know, the hormones are raging and I started to fantasize. In my mind, I always pictured myself with breasts and a vagina. But I didn't even realize I was doing it in the fantasy. Like, say it was some guy in school that I had a crush on. In my sexual fantasy, I was always the girl. But didn't even, it was just so second nature that I was doing it and not realizing I was doing it. So all of the dots were connecting in like my early 20s. And that's when I realized, oh, I'm possibly trans. So it was even before you necessarily had language. It was. And it was a visceral feeling yeah. of this is where I belong, but I don't know how to describe I what, it. I don't know what to call it. I don't know what it is. I, I, you know, I just was being it and not really knowing that there was a name for it. Yeah. Or, or a way to realize or, yeah, it. Yeah, or right, exactly. Or a way to have a realization of it. Yeah, until I started to see it in the gay clubs. And then it was like, oh. And that kind of was the trigger, I think, for me to start to connect the dots of, how, you know, what I was doing growing up. But now you said a little while ago that at the beginning, it was also a little bit fearful. So how yeah. did you transition from the fear to the acceptance. I think as time went on, seeing the seeing the the trans women in the club and you know them performing and I got more comfortable with it. Cause initially it was scary to me. I just I don't know why. They didn't treat me bad. Um and it's so it's almost embarrassing to admit it now because I'm a trans woman. But I think a lot of people, even you know, with gay men, sometimes like a gay man might see another gay man, but he's not out. And maybe instead of embracing the person, they reject it because it's fearful because you're kind of like forced to face your reality. Like these people that are living their authenticity are almost like bringing you to it and forcing you to be real about who you are. Right, it's and a confrontation. Yes, it really is, you know, and so... Um, I think that for me, that was um, the thing. And as I got more comfortable with seeing them and, you know, there were some that were friendly to me. And I remember this one, she looked at me and she says, honey, you would make a beautiful woman. Like, you know, and, and, and it was like they were seeing it me. They, they were calling it out before I even fully embraced it, you know. So, yeah. 
And what was the first thing that you did that you can recall doing when you accepted who you were? Did you get dressed? Did you go out? Yeah. Did you, who did you tell? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so there's a movement now called the gender non-conforming movement, you know, the non-binary movement. And I'm so happy about that because I think people should be able to live their authenticity regardless of what. Uh, I think for a lot of trans women, there's that period, that time frame where many of us lived androgynously. And that was the word back in the day that we used. You know, you were androgynous. You weren't necessarily living as a, a man. You weren't necessarily living as a woman. You were kind of somewhere in the middle. And there was a few years of that for me. I think that helped me actually to get my, kind of like dip my toe in the pool and kind of feel myself out and realize more of what I am. Um, and there was actually a time that I thought, I could be comfortable there. Although society was not comfortable in those days with that. Oh my God. I mean, you know, as human beings, we want to be able to label that's a man, that's a woman. They're white, they're black, you know, and the labels. And I remember in those days, because we're talking like the early 90s, um, late 80s, early 90s, is that people were very uncomfortable with the fact that they couldn't label you. You know, label. And I remember people saying to me, oh, you know, or hearing it. They wouldn't say it to me, but I'd hear, what the fuck is that? You know, was that a, was that a man or a woman? What the hell is that? You know, it was it was really blatant like that. Unless you were on a stage like Prince or Boy George, you know, Michael Jackson, you know, that's that's a whole other thing. But if you were someone like that trying to maneuver in regular society, it was it was <laughs> you were not being received with open arms, not at all. And, you know, throwing bottles and just being very, very mean. And so I think after about three years, three, four years of that, it became not enough. I was like, this isn't me. I, 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 like, I'm still not there. Like, I, I, I felt like that pulling and like saying, no, I want to be more of a woman. And so that's when I started to go down the road of black market hormones because you know again in those days the doctors a lot of the doctors were not receptive to treating transgender people and so a lot of the stuff was done black market and I took my hormones black market I then after that it was like getting we called it pumped, but it was black market injections. I went down that road, um, really rolling the dice to live my authentic truth, to, to match the way I felt on the inside with the way I looked on the outside. Yeah. And where have you lived where you have felt most comfortable? Wow. You know, I have to say that for most of my life, I really feel like I have been in a gender war, like a war, tug of war, beyond gender, a war to just be me. I really, really feel that from like a kid being bullied to then, you know, as a young adult, literally being pulled off a city bus in Philadelphia and beaten up by six guys uh, in front of 50 people during rush hour. No one helped me. And I get it. People are scared. They want to stay out of it. But, you know, for me, that was just, not only was I hurt physically, but I was just broken spiritually and emotionally. And just like my faith in humanity just was a bit shattered after that experience and two weeks later is when 
it was, it just was like, I got beat up all over again because one of the guys that beat me up, there was a girl that used to go to my old high school because I had just graduated about a year out of high school. And she said to him, why did you all beat him up? And his response was, because he's a faggot and faggots spread AIDS and they deserve to die. And how it got back to me is she went back to to school and she was like gossiping about it. And my good friend was a year behind me and he heard and then he, he brought the news back to me, the gossip back to me. But it was, I was like, I was beaten up all over again. Cause just to think like, God, that was their motivation, you know, because they saw me as gay and they felt like I deserved to die. So where where and when did you start to feel comfortable? To feel comfortable, I'm sorry. I'm going on tangents. <laughs> it's it's been a journey. It's been a journey. <laughs> and the journey continues. And the journey continues. Um, okay, so I would have to say now. And is that because you feel comfortable with yourself now? I think it's a combination of things. I think that a lot of it is me feeling more comfortable with who I am. I believe that there's been some progress for trans people because although we have a long way to go, I cannot ignore the progress that has taken place, even in the last 10 years. I remember leaving my apartment and feeling like, oh, God, you know, like I'm going out to like face the wolves like or or, here we go. It's another day in war. Whereas now, because of the exposure of trans people in the media, I think that when people see us, not everyone, I run into assholes every now and then that are just, you know, but for the most part, I think here in America, because I don't want to speak for the world. There's a lot of places in the world where being trans is uh, like a matter of life and death. So, But here in America, I have seen the progress. And also, it depends on where you are in America. Because, you know, no offense to Alabama. But, you know, if I was in Alabama, maybe it would be a different reality as opposed to being here and living here in South Florida. Uh, yeah, so what I was saying is like, when I go out now, when people see me, it's not like deer and headlights. Like, because of the exposure, oh, you know, it's a trans woman. Like, you know, people are more familiar with it, as opposed to years ago, it would be like, oh my God, like they saw a unicorn. You know, like, what is that? So I have seen some progress, and I think that that has also helped me to feel more comfortable Um, But a lot of it does lie within yourself. I do believe that because people are like, it's like, it's almost like a sheep and wolves. I'm sorry, a, a sheep going into a pack of wolves, right? People key into your insecurities and to you not being confident as opposed to if you walk with confidence, it's a whole other thing that you get from oftentimes from people. And so that that's a big thing. And it took work. It took me going to get therapy. Because for many years, I bit the bullet, you know, I just, I just, you know, lived life and it was a survival thing. And I just bit the bullet. But then I eventually thought, God, I need to go talk about things, talk about my issues and what I'm going through. So that's helped support of some of my family that are in my corner. I mean, it's a mixed bag, but I would say um, I have a good bit of family members that do love and support me. Um, Some of them don't. There are family that don't want to be bothered with me um, because I'm trans. But like I have my mom, my mom, you know, (laughs) my trans has transgenderism or me being trans has been like t- at times the the pink elephant in the room but I never felt like my mom turned her back on me like I always felt like she's been in my corner and she's loved she's loved and supported me so that makes a big difference that makes a big difference for so you got from your mother what you could never get from your father you know it's funny 
I got? Yes. I think about that a lot. I think about, my God, what if my mother was like my dad? What would have happened to me? Like, where would I, how would that have affected me? And where would that have taken me in life? My mom, in many ways, well, she was the cushion to my dad. Like, in the sense that, like, she made it easier for me, you know, um, even though she didn't understand it either, but I think her mother's love prevailed over all, you know, and, um, even at the end with my dad, I, I, I'm so thankful to God universe that I had that with him. Um, he was sick. He was in intensive care. It was the summertime. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, my mom was calling me. She said, oh, the doctors don't think he's going to make it. And I was calling every day, checking in, and he pulled through. And then he ended up uh, in September going to a rehab. I was calling every day. Um, And one day my mom told me that I called the rehab. And when after I finished talking to him and he hung up, he looked at my mom and he says, God, he called me Rajan. He says, Rajan calls every day. And he was thinking about, like, my sister who, she she had, a, my niece was, like, like, I think a year old. And she was very busy with family. So she wasn't able to go as, you know, as much as he thought she would have. And um, my mom looked at him and she said, see, see the child you treated the way you did. And. She said his eyes welled up and he says, I know. Because my sister was his princess. And, you know, so it was like, (laughs) I was like Cinderella. (laughs) And and she was the princess. And so, but, you know, she had, she definitely, in all fairness, you know, I know she has her trauma from growing up in, in the household with my dad being an alcoholic and everything. But so... What happened, he comes home. He's doing well. I'm calling all the time. I'm talking to my mom. I hear him in the background asking if it's me. He'd want to get on the phone. And my dad and I, we talked more than I think we had ever talked in my whole life. And the things he was saying to me, there was points where I would like pull the phone away. I'm like, is this my father? Because it was like, I remember it was around Thanksgiving. And he said to me, he started crying. And my dad like hardly, hardly cried. Okay. I mean, I didn't have to walk away from himself. (laughs) Yeah. No Chinese food for you. God, that's funny. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh God, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. <laughs> so he's. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay. Okay. Oh God. Okay. So so he started crying and. You know, he hardly cried. I mean, I think I saw him cry when my grandmother died, his mom. Um, But I said, Dad, what's wrong? And he says, you know, you've been gone too long. I miss you. He says, you know, what do you think I worked my whole life for? He said, for you and your sister. And he said, this is your house. And he says, I want you to come home. And I knew... That was the moment I had to make a decision because I felt like I was finally getting from my dad what I wanted, but I didn't know if he was quite ready to see me and live in color. Like, it's one thing seeing pictures, talking on the phone, but like literally being there in front of him, I just didn't feel like he was ready for that. And I didn't want to mess up what I was finally getting from him. So I stayed away out of love and I told him, I said, you know what, dad, I had just started a new project. So I wasn't lying. I said, listen, I just started this new thing. I said, let me work and 
I'll try and come home in the spring around my birthday, which um, I, my birthday is in April. It's April 7th. So um, I, I told him that and that was kind of like, oh, he says, OK, OK. But then he and, and I said, but because he could hear the hesitation. And this is the thing that let me know he wasn't completely ready is he says, it's okay. He's like, you know, you, it is, it is what it is. You know, you come home. He says, just put on some men, some guys clothes and pull your hair back in a ponytail. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, you want me to look like a butch woman? <laughs> because the thing is, it was at that point, there was no turning back. Like, and so that kind of solidified it for me. I said, no, it's probably best I stay away for now. So two weeks later, it's in De into December now. We're on the phone again talking. And um, that was 2004. What election was that? That was... Um, Bush's re-election. Yes. And my father, for whatever reason, always leaned to the Republican side. My mom is like... A, dem a Democrat for life, okay? And my sister and I, we, 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 we've gone with my mom, you know, like, I, I'm, I've always been a Democrat. But my dad, for whatever reason, he just, like, he leaned towards the... So he wanted um, him to win, to have a, to be reelected. So he was, like, kidding with me. I was like, how you doing? He's like, oh, I'm going to be great for the next four years. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah. You know, he was like, he's joking with me. Oh, yeah, we, I'm going to be fine for the next four years because my guy won, you know. And so I laughed. And then he said to me, he says, you know, I worry so much about you. He said, the world can be so cruel to your kind. And he said, I just wish I knew you were going to be okay in this world. He said, because, you know, me and your mom, we're not always going to be here. And I knew, I knew that was the death talk, you know. And I said, I know, Dad. I said, but, you know, I, I got to be me. I got to be me. And um, he says, I know. So two weeks later, he died. Oh, wow. He died two weeks, two days before Christmas, December 23rd. And um, I was so thankful to God that I had those moments with him before he died. Because I think I was able to deal with his passing easier. Because at least towards the end, we had our bonding moments. And even though he didn't fully embrace me as the person I am, I definitely saw that. He loved me. I saw that when it's all said and done, most parents want the best for their kids. And that's what he wanted for me. He wanted to know that I was going to be okay in this world. And that meant the world to me. And so I just, um, I, I just, I'm so grateful I had that. I really am. No, you, you got what you were looking for. Yeah. And whether he could accept everything or not, right. he acknowledged yeah. that you had to be yourself. Yeah, he did. He and did. that that's a huge step for somebody who walked out of your eighth grade graduation. Yeah. That's a lot of progress. It is. It is. I think he had evolved a, a great deal. And you know, I believe that our parents teach us, but we also teach our parents. I really do believe that. No, there's no question that he was a better human being because of what you went through. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, I think that you made him a much better man, and that's why he was able to cry. Yeah. <laughs> You're good at this. <laughs> and he didn't... He, and you're, he, you're good at this. <laughs> and he didn't cry for himself. He cried for you. He did. And he cried for the relationship that he didn't have, which he knew was his fault. Yeah. And so at the end, like you said, he gave whatever he could yes. for you to know how important you were to him. Oh, God. 
That's beautiful. That is beautiful. And I and I don't take it for granted. Even all these years later, you know, it's amazing how we're, we're everyone has a reason and a season, and we're all here for a time. And with people in our lives, like special people, they can be gone 20, 30 years, and it's the connection is there, and it's strong, and you feel them. And um, I do believe that. I believe that. I, even in regards to my activism, I always say that, you know, as a multiracial transgender woman of color, I know I stand on many shoulders. But through my activism, none of those lives are in vain. None of them are in vain. The ones that died, you know, just for being themselves, um, lost their lives. None of those lives are in vain. As long as we keep up the good fight, you know, and keep going towards equality and equity. It might not happen in my lifetime completely, but like I said, I have seen some progress and I have to pinch myself sometimes because I can't believe I live to see these better days. You know, I am a bit of a dinosaur. I am. Because, you know, the, the, the average lifespan of a trans woman of color is 35 years old. And uh, <laughs> let's just say I've lived <laughs> some years beyond that number, <laughs> beyond that age. Yeah, um, is my makeup horrible? I'm sorry. No, it's not. Oh, okay, good. Whew. You know, I tell you, I when I talk about my journey and like, certain things I just feel it so deeply and I just my emotions I just let it out I I'm sorry I you I, you yeah. should never apologize for that yeah. okay thank and you and you certainly don't have to apologize for that here thank you and we are thrilled mm. that we will have part of your story in our archives so that people will be able to share that experience remember my name <laughs> <laughs> they will be able to share that experience yeah. for lifetimes to come. Beautiful. And that is of great value because it's not until everybody's story is told that we will be able to overcome the mistakes of the past. Exactly. You know, that is so true. And you saying that to me just means so much because I am um, in the late, 90s, I was brutally beaten up by some guys who targeted me for being trans. And I had to fight for my life that night. And um, I was scared to call the police afterwards because, you know, the relationship between the police and the trans community just was not there. I mean, we still have our issues today, but back then it was just not there. And I remember two black eyes, a split lip, my face was swollen and I, all I wanted to do was just get home. And I um, got home and I took the ice bucket and I dumped it in a towel and I had it on my face laying in the bed and I just was crying uncontrollably. And I was pleading with God. I'm like, God, why am I like this? Why am I like this? Blaming myself for being beaten up because of the way that I am. And um, I remember I had what I call a divine intervention moment, you know, call it what you want. It was the thing that helped me to carry on. And I remember hearing a voice and it was soft, but it was clear. And all the voice said was balance my child. And as soon as I heard those words, it was like a floodgate of information. That's right. Our world is a balancing act. The, our existence is a balancing act. Why would there be one type of person? There, Of course there's going to be heterosexual people, gay people, trans people, lesbian people, all types of people, because in the scope of things, it creates balance in our existence. I had that aha moment. And I felt like in the next moment, I thought, oh my God, what if I had died tonight? 
would I have died knowing that I tried to do things, do something about the way things are for transgender people? And that was the moment, because I've always had a humanitarian spirit about me, like in high school, the Red Cross, the United Way, the community hospital. But that was the moment that I made a decision to really stand up and try and do something about the way things are for me and my people. Because, you know, you can sit down all day and complain about something, or you can try and stand up and do something about it. And, you know, you hear this with a lot of people when they go through a traumatic experience, an event that was just horrible, horrific. It's the catalyst. You know, it's the that catalyst, that thing that takes them to a point where they go on and do some good work in the world, sometimes even some great work in the world. So I sit here so thankful to God that I was able to live and that I've been able to use my life, my experiences, what I've gone through, you know, with my black market injections, a lot of the world knows about that, you know, um, to, to, to touch people. And, not only LGBTQ people. I was in an airport on my way out to California to film. And I was on the phone in the terminal, going through my phone. And I, I looked up and I see this white little old lady shuffling over to me, probably about 80-something years old. And she's like, pardon me. Um, sorry to bother you, but I just wanted to say I know who you are. And... You've been such an inspiration to my life. And I'm going to tell you, in that moment, the, sh the just the chills that went through my body, because I said, my God, that's what it's all about. Despite all the labels and all our differences, we're, we are all human beings. We're all divine vibrational energy of this universe or existence living the human experience and we can we can touch each other we can inspire each other now that woman her life probably looks so different than my life i mean in the sense that i'm a multiracial transgender woman of color she's a white american woman probably from the midwest somewhere i mean you know a, a different generation you know so but there was that human connection that happened. There was something about my story that touched her. And that just meant so much to me. Because isn't that what it's all about? And it meant something to her that you were approachable enough that she could come and thank you. Wow, I didn't even think about that. And that's on you in yeah. a really good way. Thank you. That you made her, through how she knew you, through whatever she had seen, yeah. that she felt comfortable enough to come and say thank you. Thank you. And it was beautiful. That was a moment I will never forget. I mean, that, that was definitely a moment in time for me. And... Um, it's just, it, it's, it's just, it's awesome. I mean, when you, I think we all have those moments, you know, those moments where some, sometimes you don't even realize how much you touch someone. And then you find out after the fact, the person, you know, that day you said this to me, I was really down. I needed to hear that or, or whatever. It's just amazing. And, and because the reality is we're all in this together. That's for sure. When it's all said and done. You know, we're all in this together. And, you know, I always say when you go to someone's funeral, you don't think about the house they lived in, the car they drove, the clothes they wore. You think about the way that person touched you, touched your life. Well, on that note, you have touched us. Oh, thank and you. And thank you so much for doing this. Um, I look forward to it getting up there and being posted so that we can share it with the rest of the world because you really added great value to our project. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I say one last thing? Absolutely. Okay, great. Let me just retouch my lipstick. <laughs> I'm a girl, okay? I, I, I'm one of those foo-foo girls. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta make sure it's right. <laughs>
said. I mean, that that's beautiful. Thank you for saying that. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to talk about pride. Our LGBTQ plus pride. From June 28th, 1970 to today, our prides haven't been about our ego, really. They have been about our humanity and our dignity. So, you know, when people hear pride, I, I, I have a, f a few family members that, you know, when I talk about pride, they make comments about being humble. And I'm like, I'm so humble. I'm, hum I'm one of the most humble people you will meet. You're getting it screwed up. Pride is not about our egos. It's up for us, for us LGBTQ plus people. It's about our dignity. It's about our humanity. And so I hope people remember that as the generations of LGBTQ people come along. Yeah, be proud. Stand up. Stand up with your head held high. And be proud of who you are. Thank you. Namaste.